Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Well, this week I've been invited to the Uxbridge Conservative Club here in Uxbridge. Now, I believe I've got a room full of people in there. Very excited. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Lee Anderson. <laughs> Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World, and tonight we've got some really good guests. We've got Steve Tuckwell, who's a new MP for Uxbridge and South Risley. We've got legendary broadcaster Diddy David Hamilton. We've got the very lovely Emily Carver, who's a GB News presenter, and the former leader of the Lib Dems, Sir Vince Cable. But first, let's go to the news. Good evening, I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. Former nurse Lucy Letby has been found guilty of the murder of seven babies. She was also convicted of the attempted murder of six others between June 2015 and June 2016 at the Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal ward. The 33-year-old will be sentenced on Monday. The government has ordered an independent inquiry into the case. Crown Prosecutor Pascal Jones described Letby's attacks as a complete betrayal of the trust placed in her. Little did those working alongside her know that there was a murderer in their midst. She did her utmost to conceal her crimes by varying the ways in which she repeatedly harmed babies in her care. She sought to deceive her colleagues and pass off the harm she caused as nothing more than a worsening of each baby's existing vulnerability. Police investigating the murder of a 10-year-old in Woking say they're looking for her father. Sarah Sharif's body was found at her home last Thursday after police received a call from her dad, believed to be in Pakistan, just before 3 o'clock in the morning. Detectives say they're now seeking Irfan Sharif, along with the child's stepmother and her uncle. It's believed they travelled to Islamabad the day before her death was discovered. Police have revealed they're investigating the loss of an officer's laptop and notebook which fell from a moving vehicle yesterday. Meanwhile, the PSNI have arrested a man in connection with last week's data breach in which the details of 10,000 police officers and staff were published online by mistake. A 50-year-old man has been detained under the Terrorism Act and is being questioned. Another man was arrested yesterday on suspicion of collecting information likely to be useful to terrorists. 
GB News can reveal more than 25,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister. The figure was reached just after midday today, after the border force vessel Ranger arrived at Dover Harbour with 57 people on board. And despite poor weather conditions in the Channel today, a second migrant boat has made it to UK waters. It means more than 110 migrants have arrived in Kent today. Train drivers will strike on the 1st of September and overtime will be banned the day after in a long-running dispute over pay. The strike will force train companies across England to cancel all services, while the ban on overtime will seriously disrupt the network. It will be the 12th one-day strike by ASLEV members since the dispute started a year ago. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now it's time for Lee Anderson's Real World. Today I'm joined by the Conservative MP for Uxbridge and South Ruslip. Ryslip, is that right, Steve? Ryslip. Steve, Steve Tucko, our latest MP, and the ex-leader of the Liberal Democrats, Vince Cable. Steve, straight into it. They said you would never become the MP. They said we couldn't win. We couldn't win in Uxbridge. It was going to go to, to Labour. What happened? Well, firstly, Lee, welcome to Uxbridge and South Rice. It's great, great to yeah, have you great. here. Um, in relation to my election victory, um, yeah, I was the underdog. I wasn't expected to win, um, but through hard work and through you know literally hundreds of volunteers knocking on thousands of doors, yeah. we came through with an astonishing result at about 2.30 on that Friday morning. But you had a little help on the way, Steve, didn't you? Somebody campaigned for you, gave you a good campaign plan. Well, we had we had a, a number of campaign plans, but the primary the primary message on the doorsteps that the, you know the, the good people of Uxbridge and South Rice were telling me and my volunteers is their complete and utter opposition to ULES expansion. So that was the message coming loud and clear. It was the residents of this great constituency that made it that by election a referendum on ULES. There was other areas that we campaigned on as well, which was you know retaining our local police station, which is just down the road from here, you know maintaining and building a brand new hospital, which my planning committee gave permission for and it's now got government funding and wrap that all around is I'm a local councillor here in, in Nutsbridge and South Rysip and I've got the, the hyper-local connections. Looking forward to working with you Steve. I'm going to move over to Vince next. So Vince, it's, it's great to have Steve in the House of Commons now. I'm looking forward to working with him. Uh, he led a great campaign, lots of local issues, but do you think that the ULS campaign actually helped Steve win the seat? Well, I'm, sh I'm sure it did, um, it, but it's, it's less of an issue in other places. I mean, I used to represent Twickenham. I mean, I've got a vested interest because my yep. wife has an old banger, but uh, in general, the attitude in the area is we've got very poor air quality in the town centres. There aren't too many old cars, so it's not stirred up feeling. But I was in Scotland last week and there was real feeling about you less in Glasgow because uh, most of the low income population are, are in perimeter schemes with poor public transport and the air quality isn't bad. So I think you know it's one of these things that varies from place to place and it needs to be properly designed to take the public with it. So you think there's a clear dividing line between, for example, us, the, the Lib Dems and the Labour Party? I mean, the Labour Party seem to be rowing back a little bit on this at the moment. Well, I, 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 I'm not speaking for the Lib Dems, but I, I think that in general we would we support initiatives of these kind, providing they're properly run. Yeah. And you know, you've got to take account of the fact that people have to plan their lives and phase phase out old vehicles. They need proper compensation through a, a scrappage scheme. They can't just be imposed very quickly and rapidly. But you know, we're an outer London borough in Twickenham and we, mm. we don't have the same problems with it that you have here. And you said your wife's got an old banger. I yeah. suppose there's two ways of looking at that, Vince, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we, we, we're, a, we're a two car household. I've got a, you know, a reasonably modern hybrid and it, it it's, uh, gets me around, but she's going to have to change. So you're not an old banger. Uh. Steve, the £2,000 that Mayor Collins is offering people, 
Is that cutting any ice? No, no, it's, it's totally inadequate, um, you know, and it's it's far too late. I mean, you know, I've been speaking to residents since the by-election by victory, and again, £2,000 would just not go anywhere near compensating people for, for ULES expansion. The message is absolutely clear. It doesn't need a scrappy scheme. Where it does, the mayor needs to be scrapped, not people's cars. And I think the issue here is is that, you know, here in Uxbridge and South Ryship and indeed other parts of outer London, we haven't got the same challenges that, that inner London have. We haven't got the transport links. Yeah. So ULES expansion will devastate business and it will hammer families to the tune of four and a half thousand pounds a year and it needs to be stopped. What about the voluntary sector in, in places like this? You know, people do travel on a daily basis to volunteer at various places. They don't get paid, probably don't get any petrol money or diesel money or fuel money. Surely that's going to have an impact as indeed, well. Indeed, carers is, is, is the number one sort of area that, that springs to mind when you yeah. mention that. You know, yeah. people who are, you know, unpaid carers or low paid carers, you know, it's going to, it's going to hammer them. But, but also, uh, you know, the, the, the youth provision in, in Uxbridge and South Ryshire. I was talking to Ryshire Rangers, girls, youth football team, you know, the, the grassroots girls yeah. football team are looking to develop. They've been they've been threatened with expulsion because of ULES expansion, where away yeah. teams from outside London won't come in. OK, we're going to move on to a, a different subject now. This week we've got A-level results, lots of uh, happy people going off to uni, some not so happy, Steve, Vince, but also I guess we've got two categories of young people. We've got the ones that's going to go on to apprenticeships, going to go to university. And then we see the other uh, group of young people in the news this week that think it's a good idea to take as many paracetamols as possible to see how sick they can get and, and go into hospital. Vince, what's going on in society with well, this? I don't think there are two different groups of young people. I think we just accept that, that kids of that age have been really messed around in recent years, you know, with the pandemic. I mean, I've had, you know, grandchildren who've been through this and who are, you know, very upset by it. But in terms of the A-levels, the big controversy is about cracking down now on much higher standards and stopping grade inflation. Yeah. And in principle, that's right, because the thing that really devalued the system as when you had teachers grading and of course every, every teacher or a lot of them anyway wanted to give their kids A's and encourage them but we've now, we now got more objective standards that are much tougher uh, but it's meaning that there are more kids who fail. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, some children going on progressing, having, having good educational outcomes, going off to uni, doing apprenticeships, whatever. Uh, another, and I think there are two groups of, of young people in this country. There's other young people that's doing these silly things that um, you know, sometimes I, I hear people say to me, well, there's not enough youth clubs, there's not enough sports clubs, there's not enough this and that, and government needs to invest more money in local facilities. But surely, at some stage, parents have to take some responsibility. No, and I, th I think it's a big team effort. And for all the students that are, you know, be getting their A-levels in the next sort of couple of days, wish them wish them every success. You know, I've got children who have been at university, been through apprenticeships, and I think, you know, you have to get the right balance and let people, you know, choose for themselves. But there has to be the right parental support there as yeah. well. Yeah. You know, so uh, for me, I think, you know, my my favoured, my favoured option forward is, is apprenticeships. I think there's a big place for, for for more apprenticeships. Earn as you learn as a, as a principal, but at the same time, people that want to go into higher education, let's make sure they're supported. And as these well. young people that's doing this silly stuff, Steve. How do we get to these young people and, and, and nip it in the bud? Well, I, I think again that there are plenty of opportunities out there. I mean, I've done some work with the police. You know, I went to a, a police event a couple of weeks ago. There was over 110 police cadets part of the event yeah. that I was at, at Brunel University, and I think you know that goes to to show that there are opportunities there to sort of give people that structure, you know, young, our young people that structure. Yeah. Wheelstone Football Club is another example in the middle of this constituency that have over 400 people that they are coaching and training and you know, just giving them that structure so they can take into later life. But they need good parents behind them to shove them into these places. Don't Indeed, they, they do. Yeah. Yes. I guess, I guess, Vincent, I want to come to you on, give you the last word on this. Social media, TikTok, we see these crazes where young people are doing silly things. You know, that leads to a lot of antisocial behaviour. It, it leads to people copying their peers. It leads to a lot of harm uh, in some ways for young people. Well, what this episode still does is that TikTok have been brilliantly successful in mobilising young people yeah. I and mean, the extraordinary power that they've got through social media. Um, and clearly, if you're getting large scale organised sh shoplifting, you know, the authorities have got to crack down on it and, and, and yep. appropriate punishment. Yep. And that's obviously right. But shoplifting didn't start now. I mean, when I was a kid, <laughs> a lot of my contemporaries were into it. Bit of shop in your in your long and distant. Well, past. I plead not guilty. Not but, guilty. But it wasn't unusual. Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah, but the 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 TikTok, the the Facebook, the Instagram, it's all it's all instant now. So people can look. It's it's quite fashionable. Even horrible things like harm, you know, young people harming themselves. It's it, it's out there, Steve, isn't it? 
it is. And I think, you know, we need to be looking at ways in which we can give people that structure. And, and us as well, as there's older people in, in society, role modelling the right behaviours, I think yeah. is important as well. Yeah, because I think I see an article this week where so many thousands of, of young people in this country have been stalked online by, you know, by, uh, well, perverts, basically. They've been grooming them online and it's, it's, it's quite disgusting. It's quite sad. And I hope that the, the online harms bill you know, when that when that comes in, I know, it's, I know it's been a long time in the making, but that'll go a long way to to protecting young people. You know, our young people, which they, they do need protecting. But listen, don't go away. We've got the yes no quiz coming up in a minute with Vince and Steve. <laughs> it's time for quiz of the week. It's a yes or no quiz. You know the rules, gentlemen. That's five questions. You can only answer yes or no. Steve, we'll start with you first. It's the same number one question each week. Can a woman have a penis? No. Vince? No. Vince, to you. Should the ULS expansion scheme in London be scrapped? No. Steve? Uh, yes. Number three, Steve. Is Rishi right to expand the, the licence agreements for the North Sea oil exploration? Yes. Yes. Vince? No. Shock. <laughs> Number four, um, Vince. Should we have more grammar scores in the UK, yes or no? No. No. Steve? Yes. Yes. And the fifth and final question, Steve, should we have a House of Lords? Yes. No. Interesting. Five no's, Dr. No. Well, five no's and, you know, we, you, you both got five ticks, so it means you're not dodging the, the answers. Oh, you know, you, you're prepared to be, um, to, to, you know, to put, put your answers there, put your name to something, which is great. I noticed that you didn't agree, Vince, with the exploration of, of North Sea oil and gas. Do you want to just expand on that? Well, it's, it's quite finely balanced. I mean, I used to work for Shell. I mean, I was proud oh. to do so. I was oh, right, OK. Chief economist. So you made lots of money out of fossil fuels, I have you? Make, well, I earned oh, a decent right. salary out of it. Oh, and okay. a good job. And a good pension. Um, I haven't got a Shell pension. I've got a House of Commons pension oh, like okay, you. Okay. But, um, no, I, I think it's finely balanced, and, okay. and the government got advice from its what it's called its climate change okay. committee, and they said we shouldn't do it, we don't need okay. it, and I think you have to listen to their advice. But it is quite finely balanced. I understand the point about energy security. Yeah, go and, and Steve. Well, I think if we're going to get a grip of our energy security, then we need to be taking these kind of decisions. So yeah, okay. so yes for me. Straightforward answers do not go away. We join next with Steve Tuckle, MP for Oxbridge and South Ryslip, who's going to join me getting questions and getting grilled from our brilliant audience. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. 
People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So this show is about real people and letting real people ask politicians real questions. And Steve, we've got a room full of real people today. And we're going to start with Rosemary, who's got the first question. Rosemary. I read that under the Greater London Authority Act 1999, there is a loophole whereby the government, i.e. Transport Minister, can overrule Sadiq Khan. Why isn't he? Steve, reasonable question. Well, I, I heard about this uh, last night, actually. I heard about it on GB News, and I thought it was an interesting development. But I think that the bottom line is that Sadiq Khan is responsible for transport in London. You know, he's been bailed out a number of times by local government, and I think he needs to be held accountable for the expansion of ULES. So do you think... I mean, I'm of the mind, to be honest, uh, Rosemary, that um, the people that really make this decision are the, the people of London. Would you agree, Steve? I do, and I think, you know, the, the, the message from the, the by-election uh, a few weeks ago now was loud and clear, and I think, you know, that message needs to be taken into the mayoral election next year. So, I guess, I mean, I guess my feelings on this really are that, um, yes, I'd love to see you as the expansion scrapped, but I'm a Democrat as well, and Mayor Khan was democratically elected by the people of London, and the people of London, if they don't like it, they should get rid of him next year. It's as simple as that, Steve, for me. Uh, next question is from a gentleman called Navtam. Leave the asylum seekers are not willing to board this BB barge. Um, provided all standards are met, do you think they should accept this accommodation gracefully? Steve, it's a great question. I think um, I was asked this last week, actually, um, a similar sort of question to this. The BB barge, I've looked at it and I've seen the pictures online. Looks reasonable to me. You know, do you think they should get a second chance? Well, I, I think if it's if it's good enough for hard-working professional oil rig workers, then I think it's good enough for for immigrants to be to be housed on. You see, back in February, I visited Cali. I went to um, I went to see the the migrants in the camps in Cali, and they were living in in squalor. If I'm honest with you, they were living in one-man tents. They were living in little bivouacs. They were on pallets. They they were filthy. There was no sanitation. You know, it was it was freezing cold. The, the the conditions are absolutely appalling. Yet we see some of these illegal migrants, and I don't always blame the illegal migrants. I think sometimes it's the lefty lawyers, it's the human rights campaigners, it's the charities that are telling these migrants that this accommodation isn't up to scratch. And I see them moaning about things like Wi-Fi. There was the Care for Cali was complaining last week about they only had one bus every hour. You know, there's some people in my constituency would love a bus every hour to the next village or and go and see the GP. So, I don't know, Steve, what do you think? Do you think they're being coached? No, again, I think, you know, Labour have put blockers in front of the government in every step of the way in dealing with illegal immigration. And I think, I'll come back to my own point, you know, if the if this barge is good enough for really professional, you know, high quality oil rig workers, then it must be good enough for, for migrants to be accommodated on. Yeah. Navtam, some of these these lefty lawyers, these do-gooders, these these human rights campaigners, these, these charity bosses, do you think they should step up to the plate and start and house some of these illegal migrants? Well, the, the biggest one is, of course, the leader of the opposition. Um, you know what he has done in the past. Uh, I, th I think, you know, if the, the board meets all the requirements, I think it's a superb uh, accommodation and they should really gracefully accept it. Uh, this country is very welcoming. I came here in 71 and I was welcomed. And today I'm, I'm here flourishing. And I think all of them would be appreciative that, you know, we are a welcoming society. So Navdan makes a really good point. He says we are a welcoming nation. He arrived here in 1971. You know what? We do welcome people, see, from all over the world. You know, we're a kind, we are a loving, we are a caring, welcoming nation. But what we don't like is unfairness. We don't like people coming across the channel uh, who are quite clearly not genuine asylum seekers. They're, 
economic migrants. Mm, absolutely. And again, you can see this is a, a problem right across Europe. But coming back to the situation here in the UK, I think you know there's been some there's been some great work in agreements with Albania, agreements with Bulgaria. Yeah. We've got a better working relationship with, with France now. And I think we just need to stick with the plan and make sure that we get a real grip on this illegal immigration situation. And get a good outcome in the Supreme Court to make sure these Rwanda flights get off the ground. Yeah, and I think, you know, the Supreme Court has said, you know, there's no objection to using a third party yeah. nation. Just Rwanda wasn't on the table in that particular case. But let's see what the Supreme Court comes back with now. That's great. So I think the, the last question is from Tony. If Mr Khan is so concerned about air pollution, why does he not bring his measuring outside schools? I live within 100 yards of a primary school. And at pick-up time, an hour before half past three, cars are parked up, engines running in the winter for heaters to be kept on, and in the afternoon, in the summer, for air conditioning. That's where pollution is coming from. So, Steve, is uh, Mercon ignoring schools? Well, Tony makes a really great point there, and I think everybody in this room really wants, you know, high-quality air, particularly around our schools. Here in Hillingdon, um, we have a t dedicated team which is encouraging parents to use uh, either walk or use public transport to get to schools. And I think we need to do more on legislation around what Tony's mentioned there around idling. You know, so is that something? Here. Now you're the MP for this wonderful area. You're going to be campaigning for to get you know get the air quality checked outside schools. Yeah, and I, I think we we have air quality monitoring stations right across Hillingdon and Hillingdon has, has been seen to be having good air quality so we need to just be making sure that you know not just in schools but around health health facilities as well we just make sure that the right systems are in place to discourage uh, air pollution and that you know idling that's been mentioned there is something that we need to be doing more that, to enforce. Okay it sounds like this uh, great area is, is, in, is in good hands um, I look forward to working with you, Steve, when Thank you get you back know. to Parliament. But look, coming up, we've got Vince Cable and Emily Carver. You don't want to miss this one. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. Overnight, Storm Betty will bring lashings of wind and rain to the UK. In some places, gales, as well as in other places, thunderstorms. Betty was named by Met Erin, the Irish Met Service, because the strongest winds will be affecting Southern Ireland overnight, but also western parts of England, southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland. And Wales will see gales and in some places 60 or even 70 mile per hour wind gusts. The worst of the winds move through overnight, but there's also the risk of thunderstorms developing across the east of England and persistent rain for Scotland and Northern Ireland. So all in all, a lively night of weather and a warm night as well, staying fairly muggy. We start off Saturday with the wet and windy weather moving through Irish sea coasts, Northern Ireland as well as Scotland. The most persistent rain arrives into the north of Scotland, but we'll continue to see further spells of wet weather for the rest of Scotland, Northern Ireland and North West England. Across the rest of England and Wales, it brightens up. There'll be some showers, but also some decent sunshine. And in the southeast, 26 Celsius, it's going to stay relatively humid. Sunday, all in all, is a brighter day, particularly for northern areas. Again, a mix of sunny spells and showers. Still a brisk breeze from the southwest, but that's going to be bringing once more some higher temperatures at times. So mid-20s possible in the southeast, turning even warmer in the south through next week, staying changeable in the north. The temperature's rising. Boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast, Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So joining Vince and I now, we've got the brilliant GB News presenter, Emily Carver. Emily, thanks for Thank coming. For We're going to get me. straight into it today, um, because we've only got a few minutes. Yeah. This week, Extinction Rebellion, as this chap name, it's, it's Roger Hallam, has described the ULES expansion as intrusive and regressive. This is quite amazing, actually, because you've seen a lot of people in the le on the left sort of roll back from this policy now, yeah. that they've realised how it's actually impacting people they're supposed to support. I mean, the Labour Party, presumably, is there caring about those on the lowest wages, caring about people who can't afford um, necessities. And then you've got uh, Sadiq Khan in London essentially putting this fee on people with cars that need to get around. So, so it's quite interesting, though, isn't it, that a man from Extinction yeah. Rebellion, a co-founder of Extinction yeah. Rebellion, would come out against an anti-car policy on the grounds of progressivism. Do you think we're going to see XR now on the streets protesting, spraying buildings, digging people's lawns up, campaigning against the ULEX expansion? I'm not sure that would make him very popular with his usual supporters, because, of course, his usual supporters are sort of uh, liberal metropolitan types who would n normally support the ULEZ scheme, wouldn't they? They would be the types of people. So he may very much be at loggerheads with the people who's, who he's usually all buddy-buddy with. But, of course, you had people um, puncturing tyres, slashing tyres, slashing the tyres of anti-ULEZ protesters. Yes. So who knows? It could work the other way around. Um, but he goes on to say that he doesn't support this policy, but what he does support or what he would support is more taxes on the rich. OK, that's normal. Everyone from Extinction Rebellion would like that. But also that he'd support carbon rationing on the richest 1% or whoever, presumably most of the country he'd support that for. So think about that. What would that mean? Mm. So much control. So, I don't know, Lee, you're only allowed one bus trip this week. You're only allowed one flight this year. You're only allowed one holiday. Uh, you can't have that car. Uh, you can't have this or that. Um, but this is the sort of dystopian world that we could end up with yeah. if we keep allowing uh, people like Sadiq Khan yeah. and other groups to take hold of our uh, democracy like this. 
Vince, this is a turn up for the book. Surely Extinction Rebellion now saying we should uh, we should not expand the, the ULES expansion scheme? Yeah, I, I think they shouldn't be backing off, actually. this is If you're an environmentalist, this is a very good initiative. And I, as I said earlier on, I mean, providing it's properly designed, it's a good thing. I mean, it was, it was very popular in inner London. Well, you've got all the very rich people, but very poor people, but they've got... Well, when you say popular, Vince, popular with who? Well, it was popular with the public. Um, but really? and the, the, the problem has been in the suburbs, right, where we are now. Where you get the public, the public transport isn't as good, and the air quality is better, so it's less urgent. But you know, certainly the sense I have in the part of London I live, and another part of outer London, Twickenham, is that people see the benefits of it; they're not very hostile. But hang on, there's been public consultation after public consultation where people have said they do not support the expansion of ULES, and it just gets ignored. I don't know why they even bother doing these consultations, because they clearly mean nothing, and these policies are rubber-stamped anyway, and it's going to be expanded on the 29th of August, come what may. Meanwhile, people are absolutely terrified of the cost of this. Isn't it about time, though, Emily, we had a consultation on the air quality on the undergrounds in London? Well, that's a good point. That's a good point, but I don't know what you could do about that, and I'm not a physicist or an engineer, well, but it is where there is a huge amount of pollution. That is what people say, isn't it, Vince? Vince, yeah. the underground. Well, you've got to, you know, you've got to modernise the metro. You know, we've got the Elizabeth Line, the great, great advance, it's, and it's certainly much higher quality than than the old lines that were almost a century old. But, you know, the underground system of London is one of the best systems in the world, and we should be proud of it and but expand it. But that's not really the point. People should be able to make choices in their lives, and this is what annoys me. It's we know best at the London Assembly. I know best as London Mayor what is best for you, your family, your business. He even had the cheek, Sadiq Khan to say that this is for the benefit of tradesmen. So this is for the benefit of your local plumber. This is for the benefit of your local builder because they'll have to take off fewer days for asthma. When was the last time your plumber complained about asthma? But when was the last time they complained about the cost of getting around London? I mean, it is ludicrous. Well, the problem is that traffic is partly a matter of personal choice and I want people to have choice. I own a car and I love it. Um, but, but at the same time, you have to take account of the everybody pitches on the road at the same time in the same place, you've got congestion. You know, there are social impacts, not just congestion, but bad air quality. Yeah. And somebody has to make a decision about the wider public interest. And I, I do believe this scheme has got to be better designed. You've got to try and give people proper warning. You've got to try and help them with the scrappage, the costs of, of winding up an old car. We can't but the principle to pay is a good for one. everyone to get a new car. I mean, that's ridiculous too. People say, oh, if only the scrappage scheme was more generous. Okay. Well, hang on then. But uh, yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. But, you know, the taxpayer then has I'm, to I'm going to calm you both down for the moment. We want to have a simple yes or no question. Vince, you're used to this. If there was a referendum on the ULES expansion, would the people of this great area vote for it, yes or no, Emma? Emma. Um, would they vote for it, in yeah. favour of it? No, I very much doubt it. Vince? In my area, yes. Yes, definitely? I think so. Well, there you go, a slight disagreement there. But next, we've got Wokey of the Week. And we're going to be joined by Vince Cable and Emily Carver. Time for Wokey of the Week. This is a part of the show where we pick three woke organisations or people and we pick a winner to see who's been the Wokey of the Week. So the first one is emergency operators when you ring 999 and asking people um, which pronoun do you require. Now, just imagine, guys, you're gasping your last breath. You're on your own. You've crawled three miles to a telephone somewhere in the middle of a country lane. And, you know, you're on your last knockings and somebody's asking you, which, which pronoun are you? It's very silly. Is, is, it, is it true? Well, according, it is true. To, according to my fact sheet, it's true. Uh, the second Wokey of the Week is entitled Scouts Honour. Uh, the Scouts have released a style guide which calls for postmen to be called postal workers and firemen to be called firefighters. Now, again, you're in 999. Your house is on fire. Your cat's stuck up in, in loft. You know, it's burning down, you're ringing up, and does it really matter if they're firemen or firefighters or firewomen or, or fire what? 
I think it's just a load of nonsense, to be honest, but, yeah. you know, bear that in mind. So, uh, Wokey of the Week number three is James O'Brien. He's a um, LBC um, radio presenter. He's a regular in, in this section of the show. He's always on there. He spends most of his time having a go at me and my good friend Brendan Clocksmith and Jonathan Gullis and a few other sensible politicians. So, he's, he's always on there. So, I guess we're going to throw this to the audience and then um, they go, are they going to boo or clap? Or I think they're going to boo. I think they're going to boo. Let's, 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 let's have boos on each one. So, the first one is... The, the pronoun question on the emergency operators. Can we have a boo? Ooh. That's a boo. And the second one is the scouts calling postmen, postal workers and firemen to be called firefighters. Ooh. Slightly subdued boo there. Uh, and number three, um, I mean, I've got my fingers crossed for this one, is uh, James O'Brien. Well, there you go. I think this week's winner, obviously, is the oh, emergency well. operators. Yeah. They are... The Wokey of the Week. I think that's a good choice, actually. What do you think, guys? Well, it's a good choice, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's spectacularly silly. I'd yeah. be quite offended if someone at the emergency oh. services asked what my pronouns were. Yeah. You would assume it was quite obvious from the pitch of my voice. So that's great. Another lively debate there, guys. Thank you for helping with Wokey of the Week. Look, do not go away. Joining us next is broadcasting legend Diddy David Hamilton. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Last orders at the bar, and tonight I'm joined by an icon of broadcasting, Diddy, David Hamilton. David, thanks for coming. Best part about this show for me is, actually, I get to meet people like you every single week. Yeah, it's lovely to meet you, and actually, I'm just here, really, to make the drinks look bigger. 
Oh, well, you're certainly doing that, David. Now, let's, oh, let's, try. <laughs> let's rewind, because you come from an era, probably the same as my parents, born in the 30s. Yeah. So you'd have been, you know, growing up during the war and in the yes. 50s. You'd have seen some tough times, David. Yes, I did. My father was uh, in the army during the war. After the war, my parents uh, divorced and um, they lived in very small flats. So I had a, you know, quite a, quite a poor upbringing, really. But um, when I was uh, 17 or 18, I was called up to do my national service okay. in the RAF. Okay. And uh, I was, po this is how I began in radio. So what year would that be then? That was uh, 1957. And uh, I was, uh, I joined the RAF and I was posted to Germany. And I was very lucky I got onto the British Forces Network radio station. Okay. And I was actually one of the first DJs to play rock and roll. Wow. Until that time, music was, how much is that doggy on the window? Yeah. And um, feet up, pat him on the popo. And suddenly, you know, we had our own music. We had rock and roll. It had energy, it had zest, it made you want to get up and but dance. rock and roll, 1950s, yep. you're in the RAF, mm -hmm. you're being posted abroad. Yep. Now, it's Elvis week this week. Yes. Elvis died 46 years ago. Yeah. He was in Germany yes. uh, during the... He 50s. was in Germany at the same time as me. He was with the US Army doing his national service. He was in Frankfurt and I was in Cologne. So I didn't meet him, but uh, I did play his records along with, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis and Little yeah. Richard. It was a very exciting time. And that was the start of a career that somehow or other I've dragged out for 60 years. So I guess, you know, you know, I'm a big Beatles fan, I'm an Elvis fan. Yeah. I guess during the 50s, a lot of the English bands, American bands and artists went to Germany to play, didn't they, in, in the clubs? Yes, well, the Beatles started at uh, the Beat Club in Hamburg. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, early 60s, so not that long after I was there. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's the way a lot of the bands started. I did one of the first television interviews with the Beatles. Wow. Uh, it was 1963. They'd had about two hit records. And uh, they were doing a tour with Helen Shapiro. Yep. She was top of the bill. They played Sheffield. I was at the studio in Manchester. And uh, they haired across to Manchester. And uh, I got an interview with them on a program called ABC at Large. And then uh, later that year, I introduced them in concert in Manchester. And tickets to see the Beatles were 10 shillings. How much is that in today's money, David? Uh, it was it was not much money e even then. It was pretty cheap then. Yeah. Uh, and the following year, I introduced the Rolling Stones. Uh, and uh, I think my fee, I think, was 12 guineas. That was 12 pounds and 12 shillings. And so I parked my car. I had a little red MGB sports car. Yeah. And I parked it at the back of the theater. Somebody thought it was Mick Jagger's car and scratched a love note on it. So for a week, I was driving around with... I love you, Mick, on the bonnet of my car. And did you follow up this love note? Quite, quite embarrassing. You... Well, I liked him, but I didn't like him that much. <laughs> so, Elvis, <laughs> the Beatles, yeah. Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones. You know, you've been yeah. a broadcaster, you've been involved in this industry for, what, since 1959? Yeah, well, I think it's about 64 years now. Wow, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. And I'm now actually the oldest person doing a national daily radio show, because yeah. I do a show on a station called Boom, Can Boom you give radio. us a, a couple of standout memories, David, for your time in broadcasting? Uh, well, I think, uh, obviously, when I started, it was very exciting, uh, because I was, uh, I was really not much more than a teenager. Yeah. Um, so that was very exciting. I think when I got my own daily show on Radio 1 in 1973, and I was part of a lineup that was Tony Blackburn, Noel Edmonds, Johnny Walker, uh, Fluff Freeman, you know, so it was a great team yeah. to be on. Um, uh, but uh, it's all been great, you know, the whole, the whole time of it has been wonderful. And, of course, I worked with Ken Dodd, yeah. which is where I got my yeah. nickname. Yeah, Diddy. Diddy, yeah. yeah. A lot of people thought it was after he saw me in the shower. <laughs> but uh, there was no truth in that rumour. Are you sure about that? Well, that's what he said. For Ken Dodd, he was a great man. He's a great comedian. Mm. I saw Ken Dodd perform a couple of times. Um, I think the last time I saw him, he must have been 85, 86. Yes. And well, he was on for about five hours. He went on to nearly 90. I mean, beyond my age now. And his shows went on for five hours. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the audience has missed the last bus is going That's home. That's true. That's true. It was great working with him. We did a TV series called Doddy's Music Box. And it went out on Saturday nights yeah. at the time. And, of course, he was number one with Tears. He was the Variety Club Entertainer yeah. of the Year. He'd had a long sellout 
season at the London Palladium. So he was a huge star. And when he did his personal appearances, people would say, would you bring Diddy David along? <laughs> and, um, of course, we opened shops together. We opened yeah, supermarkets yeah. together. Huge crowds turned up, you know, and he'd get the old funny brown envelope afterwards. Really? Know. Really? And what was in that brown envelope? Well, it was a lot bigger than my brown envelope, uh, I can tell you that. And did any of that go to the VAT man? Uh, I, there was no VAT in those days. <laughs> that was before VAT. Or the tax man, should I say? Uh, the tax man. Well, you know, Ken had this famous case, yeah. uh, Inran Revenue versus Ken Dodd, and it was a Liverpool jury, and uh, Liverpudlians loved, adored Ken Dodd, were not terribly fond of the Inran Revenue, <laughs> and so they said not guilty. And two weeks later, Ken was back on stage doing gags about the inland revenue. And he said, I remember the days when income tax was two pence in the pound. He said, I thought it still was. <laughs> that was great. I can remember that, child. Did he defend himself? No, no. George Carman, okay. who was the most wonderful QC. And George Carman famously said, he said, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, accountants are comedians, but no comedians are accountants. Oh. And uh, the, ju the jury said not guilty. Yeah. So you've gone through the decades, David, from the 50s yeah. to the present day. Yeah. You've seen a lot of changes. You know, music's definitely changed. And, yeah. you know, I, I like the 50s and 60s and, and the 70s, the glam rock period as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think music was better in yesteryear? Or do you think it's developed into something well, much better? Or is it, is it, is it too... I don't know. I think uh, what I would say about 60s and 70s music was it was very happy. You know, the, the 70s, as you remember, do you remember the 70s? I do remember the 70s, yeah. Um, uh, the 70s was, a, it was a tough decade. You know, we had mass unemployment, yeah. we had rampant inflation, yeah. lots of uh, strikes, a bit like now, really. Yeah. Um, and the music was so happy and bright that it cheered everybody up. And that was the thing about the music at that I time. I think the music in the 70s, which I particularly like, were, were bands like Mud, yes. Bay City Rollers, yeah. T-Rex, yep. uh, Racy, The yeah. Real Bets, Albert yes. Stardust, Susie yeah. Quattro. Yeah. Did you That's, come across these artists? All, well, I worked with them all. I, yeah. I compared the Bay City Rollers tour and I compared David Cassidy's tour. When he what was, was that like? Thousands of Screaming Girls? What was Thousands that Thousands like? of Screaming Girls. Uh, I remember them, you know, banging on the door of my dressing room. Eventually, I had to let them out. It was, it was, <laughs> it was really awful, you know. Is that bad, was it? I feel your pain, David. So out of all the artists you've worked with, which ones or which group or which artists would you, you, do you look back and think, wow, that's I'll tell special. you the person I was most excited to meet was Roy Orbison. Yeah. And he was a great hero of mine. One of the first mm. records I bought was Only the Lonely. Yeah. And I got one of the last television interviews with the Big O. And he's sitting next to me, as near to me as you are now, with the shades on. And I suddenly thought to myself, my God, I'm sitting here yeah. with, with the Big O, Roy yeah. Orbison, who'd been a star throughout my lifetime, you know. So um, although I, I interviewed the Beatles and the Stones, and plenty of others, I think Roy Orbison was the one I was most excited to meet. You see, we were talking about Elvis earlier. I'm a yeah. big Elvis fan. Now, Elvis did once famously said that Roy Orbison had got the best voice of any yes. singer. Yes. Have you, have you seen uh, the silver uh, uh, video of Roy Orbison with Bruce Springsteen? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, where, where they all jam with him. Yeah. Is it Traveling Tra Wilbur, Costello? is it? Is it Traveling Wilbur? No, no, but it was, it was, uh, it was Tom Petty who okay. was tra uh, Traveling Wilbur. Yeah. Elvis Costello, uh, the, the boss, Bruce Springsteen, oh. uh, playing Pretty Woman yep. and singing with... Uh, the, the big O, Roy Orbison. Look, Fantastic. David, David there's That's a reason great. we're yes. stood behind a bar today. Yeah. That's Do you because... want to buy me a drink? No, no. Oh. Um, I've heard you've got long pockets. <laughs> You're going to pull a pint. Every week we get uh, our celebrity guest to pull a pint. Really? And we're going to call in Esme. Where's Esme, the landlady? Oh. Come on in, Esme. Oh. You remember there, David? Yeah. Um, 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 so, th this basically... One, this one here. Yeah, it's the cold... It's, is it the Any cold... Any Esme? Uh, yes, put the glass up. That'll be handy. Yeah, pick on, the David, glass up. And pull okay. the pump bike. And then I just pull. Just yep. pull, yeah. Just pull. Okay. pull. It's a long time since I pulled, so... Oh, oh yeah, look at that. It's, uh, I, think, I think this is going to have a That's rather... It. If you just hold it down, it'll Don't be fine. Do I keep pulling? Mm -hmm. Do I keep pulling? Just leave it. Oh, no, look just let that. it go. Yeah, let it go. I see. You've never done this before. This is actually a virgin of performance. It's like, oh, I think... I think so, you might. So, David, if you would come up yeah, out there, I think you might say as that's got a rather here, large it? head. So, Esme, I'm looking at that, and um, it's got a rather large head, isn't it, Esme? What do you think? I think. Be kind. I think probably a five for effort. I think. Yeah. What do you think? Would you drink it? 
I would, yes. Serious question, Esme. Serious question. If you gave that to a, uh, a punter in here, what would they say to you? Well, I wouldn't give it to them, no. if I'm honest. That... <laughs> no, but you're the, you're the expert, aren't you? You know. Yeah, so it's that bad? It's quite bad, yes. So yeah. you listened to a few of the uh, stories that, that David was telling us earlier, Esme. Yeah. He's met some wonderful yeah, people, hasn't like he? Yeah, it have. I was listening to Do you Roy like all Orbison. those people? Roy yes, Orbison. a few of them my mum used to listen to. Your mum? <laughs> You sure it wasn't your grandma? <laughs> just, I think he's just trying to make you feel old, there, David. I mean, yeah. the, the the Beatles story, the the uh, the Rolling Stones. The, yeah. I think my favourite actually, David, was the uh, the Roy Orbison story. Yeah, Roy Orbison. Um, uh, did you like Roy Orbison? Yes, very what much. Yeah. And why did he wear the glasses? Why did he wear the glasses all the time? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but it was his trademark, wasn't yeah. it? Really? Yeah. Uh, and um, he wrote some great songs for other people as well. And he had well. a lot of tragedy in his life as he well, didn't he? He started out writing for the Everly Brothers yeah. before he had... He had tra yes, his wife was killed in a motorcycle yeah. accident on the back of his motorbike. Yeah. He had a lot of tragedy in his life. I think one of his children died in house fire as well. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Royal Bisson story. Yeah, so I guess what we need to do is put the, the shameful five on the scoreboard, David. It is a, it, well, it have, is you a, had, have you had worse than that? Yeah, it's, it's we have. Five, we so have. I think five is about right. So yeah, Have you had people do it worse than me? David, we've got yeah. the scoreboard here. Oh, here's the scoreboard. Um, we've got you at the bottom oh. here. Yeah. Uh, I've got, sorry, I've got to give you five. Oh, I mean, am I the worst? Technically, no. I mean, Lizzie Cundy got a zero, but that was... Oh, how did she manage... Uh, David Van Day, did he get a zero as yeah, well? Yeah, he got, he got a zero. How can you uh, get a zero? Uh, well, it's... Uh, well, on, you, must, you, if it was worse than mine, it must have been bloody he awful. It was, was worse. Look, that's Central. on the pull again. Great guest, Diddy David Hamilton. The judge, as has done a cracking job. Thanks for inviting us all to your no pub today. Problem, it's been it absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for watching Leanderson's Real World and a massive thanks to all my brilliant guests this week. Look, if you've got a pub, and you want us to come to it, then please let us know on gbviews at gbnews.com and we'll bring a dose of common sense. But next week, we've got some brilliant guests. We've got James Sunderland, who's the MP for Bracknell. We've also got celebrity psychic Sally Morgan. I didn't see that one coming. And good night and stay safe. Brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. Overnight, Storm Betty will bring lashings of wind and rain to the UK. In some places, gales, as well as in other places, thunderstorms. Betty was named by Met Erin, the Irish Met Service, because the strongest winds will be affecting Southern Ireland overnight, but also western parts of England, southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales will see gales and in some places 60 or even 70 mile per hour wind gusts. The worst of the winds move through overnight but there's also the risk of thunderstorms developing across the east of England and persistent rain for Scotland and Northern Ireland. So all in all a lively night of weather and a warm night as well staying fairly muggy. We start off Saturday with the wet and windy weather moving through Irish sea coasts, Northern Ireland as well as Scotland. The most persistent rain arrives into the north of Scotland 